what a wonderful day. What a, a grand joy to once again be with the saints and have the opportunity to love up on you and spend some time with you. I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity that the Lord gives us uh, to, to come together in fellowship and worship and praise and and, uh, and be soaked in his word. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, you know, I think in these in these dark days that we're facing, folks, uh, prayer becomes a much more prevalent weapon against uh, the infirmities of this world. And uh, we need to utilize the, that weaponry. Hello, his mom. Pleasure. We need to utilize that weaponry on a daily basis. And, and, and the Bible calls us to consistent prayer, to walking in the spirit, to, you know, to a perpetual um, connection to the Lord. And that is... That's the benefit of the veil being torn, folks. <clears throat> There's nobody between us and God. You know, that the, the, the greatest privilege we've been given besides grace is the reality that we can step into the throne room at any point and call him dad and realize that we can lay before him all of our burdens and take back peace. And so uh, as a general practice, um, it makes a lot of sense to to do that as often as you can throughout the day, to do that as often as you can through your dreams, to do that as often as you can by walking in his Holy Spirit and saying, look, um, Holy Spirit, please bring forth your fruits. Don't, don't ever let me quench you. Let, please guide me in this, in this path that I'm meant to walk, that I might be an example or an end sample to, to the saints where I might walk in such a way that de that delivers a clear vision to, to us all that um, that the Lord is guiding my steps. That's, that's what I want. I, I want people to look upon me and go, look, I, you know, that guy is, is inadequate, but that's wonderful because when I am weak, only he can fill me with that which I don't have. And so I pray for that moment of weakness, that moment of inadequacy, that moment of powerlessness, because anything that he does through me is going to be evident to the world as, as an example to the saints and as an example to the world that the Lord loves me enough to show up. And that's, that's what it's about, right? Is that we, we want to be empowered. We want to be filled by him. We want to become his... Uh, a, a, um, a subject of his reflection. I mean, that's that's what I'm looking to achieve is how close do I resemble um, the Lord? How, you know, when people look upon me, do they see the power? Do they see the love? Do they see the kindness? Do they see the forgiveness? Or do my worldly inadequacies, my, my, my worldliness, does that get in the way of my, you know, my uh, capacity to, to achieve for the Lord? Am I putting my powers, my limited authorities in front of the, the example I could be showing people by being indwelt, fully indwelt by God's Holy Spirit, fully, you know, demonstrating the, the love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, you know, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control to the world that so desperately doesn't need me they need the love of God. They need to end that war with God. And that's that's why I'm here is, look, folks, I can show you where to meet him. I can show you a little bit of his reflection. I pray that he demonstrates that for you. I can show you perhaps he, he may use me as a vehicle to place the call to grace upon your heart. Amen and amen, right? I mean, that's that's what I'm here to achieve. And we're, we're in tough times, folks. We're in tough times, but we're in tough times that he said we're going to come. And we're in tough times fully enabled and fully empowered by the sovereign authority that, that created all things. By him, through him, for him, you know, from him all things were created. And he lives inside my heart. And so I, I need fear nothing in this world. What I, what I need fear most is God's transformational call upon my life to change me, to transform me, to make me into a new creature, to to, to prepare me for, for the next life, to, to prepare me for what's coming. 
and I, I really look forward to that 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 pain of transformation, that that unique pregnant feeling, you know, that that difficult feeling, or the odd feeling of becoming something new. You know, the Koreans have a verb that I never quite understood in, in English until I applied it to Christianity, and that's toida. You know, the the act of becoming. And so each of us, you know, has has chosen the chrysalis, has chosen the, the the crucible, has chosen the walk, has chosen something different, because we know we're going to have to be something different for the next world. And in so doing, we get to show an example to those folks here, who who are looking for that demonstrative hope that surpasses the craziness of this world. I mean, that's what we're really looking for. We're looking for something to hold on to, an anchor to hold on to in this world as we go through the trials that completely is relevant. Something that makes sense. Something that's authentic. Something that's real. Something that when I test it in my own thoughts or I go and go to the Bible or go to any other book, I go, I keep coming back to the realization that it's true every single time. And that's what the word of God reveals to me every single time I take it and I look up, look upon the world, I port portray it upon the world in a biblical worldview or, or I, I come back to the Bible and I look for something that I've seen in the world and seen in myself, or I, I have a dream and I take it to the, the word and I match it against the word and I say, well, wow, that really compulsorily demonstrates to me that it's just always true. It stands the test of our, our not only our own investigation, but it, it always, I mean, why do you think they've never been able to destroy this word? The enemy has tried to take this word down for thousands of years. How, how is it possible that this still resides as the, as the world's greatest selling book of all time? It's never been refuted. That's never been canceled out. They they've tried their best. They've put their greatest and brightest minds to the to the test of destroying this book. How how come they haven't been able to? Because it is the inerrant, you know, indisputable truth of an Almighty God, a picture outside of time, a reflection into time, that we might look at the truth ourselves and know. That there is an anchor. There is something we can hold on to. And his name is, is the Alpha and the Omega, the Rock of Ages, the, the, the beginning and the ending, the, the sovereign, all, all, almighty, righteous, holy God. And that's what prepares us for whatever outcome we'll face. And to that end, I want to ask him to, to shower me, to 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 fill me with his word, to write it upon my heart, that when I go into any trial, that I go, look, this is, this is going to hurt. I'm going to be transformed by this world. I, I'm going to be, I'm going to have the dross removed from me, and to have the dross removed from me as, as pure gold, I need to be heated up to about 1,500 degrees. <laughs> you know, I mean, the reality is, is, look, the only way to get stronger for us is to to go into a trial that makes us stronger. You know, you bike uphill every day for for a year. Suddenly, you have big, thick legs, and you have strong, strong lungs. It's it's a weird how that thing happens, huh? Well, it's the same thing with the word. The longer we remain in the word, the the more inclined we we get towards his his ear. Remember. He's in heaven, so <laughs> that's an up that's an uphill battle, man. <laughs> the reality is, is this this word will wash over you, it will cleanse you, it will fill you with every good gift that you need coming from heaven. It is perfect in its reflections and its rebukes and its admonitions of our worldly behavior. It it gives us guidance, it gives us direction. It tells us how to have a good relationship with the Holy Spirit. It tells us what the Spirit gives us in order to, to walk forward in this world boldly and with an understanding that we might stand against all the fiery darts of an enemy that look, is wandering around looking to consume everybody. 
we're, we are beyond just education here. We are, we are into the port of transformation, into the, the port of edification. We are being reconstructed stronger than we were. We're being made into something different. And that takes some reflection. That takes some, some reflection upon this world and saying, look, I'm, I'm being turned into something new. I don't know what that thing is, but I'm going to voluntarily subject myself to the, the hands of, of the master craftsman that's shaping me and molding me and transforming me and changing me and notching me and, and you know, and remolding me into something that, that is useful for the next life. I'm being given the tools that I'm going to need there. Not only being healed from what's what's happening here, and you know, it's so funny. I, I don't. I never want to argue with people. I, I don't have. I don't have that that argument kind of <laughs> desire. That argument gene. But the Lord continues to send people to argue, so that I, I realize how much I hate it, and and to develop the the capacity to to use His fruits instead of worldly argument. To use his long suffering, to use his goodness, his kindness, his gentleness, his faithfulness, that I don't have to argue, that I may listen, you know, and I may reflect and, and sometimes just walk away with saying nothing. And that's that's very, you know, that's a revelation when you, when you see someone transform from completely a worldly function of ego into something that's that's more supernatural that that considers the outcomes of God. And so as we're each being transformed, we, we begin to to have an interplay with the world, an interplay with each other that's different than it was. And that's what we're as the body are called to. We're called to a unity. We're called to 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 love one another to a point where we begin to give each other a break. We begin to to look at each other and go, you know, that's my brother and my sister, and I'm just going to love them. It's not my job to correct them. You know, if I can come alongside and edify, if I can come alongside and and, and direct a bit, if I can come alongside and just provide a little energy or love or prayer in order to get them to the next next level, well, well great. And, and equally, if I can't do anything, I won't do anything. You know, silence is, is off times the exact thing that people need they need they just need a, an open ear and that's the difficult part of of christianity is that you know god says look um you know don't be quick to talk you know don't don't get angry quickly you know he says listen that's really what i want and how many of us are are taking the word of god and and you know enacting it and importing it into our own lives and saying, you know, that's what God wants for me. That's what I need is to be. And for me, it's, it's gentleness. You know, this world is so brutal. I, I learned the tools of brutality in my worldly being and, and it's, it's difficult to be gentle. You know, when you, when you attempt to use worldly assets, you have to, you, you can't continue to use worldly assets. You have to step back into the spiritual assets, the fruits of the spirit, because if you continue to use your worldly assets, the, the world taught you brutality. The world taught you ungentleness, you know, um, winning at all costs, you know, those things. Th that's the aspects that are not going to work. They, they just don't work. You need to bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Let's go before the Lord in, in, in prayer just for a moment. I, I think we need him now more than we ever have. And we may not see it, but if this world is going to survive this, this present calamity, because we see the powers and principalities waiting at the door, we see them arising, we see them um, functionally trying to take control of the planet, which is, you know, to be honest, that's, um, that's a signal of the times. It's, it's you know, it, it really is demonstrative of the fact that God's clock is winding down and they know it. And they know that they're going to have an opportunity here to, to, to take greater control. But it's all God's plan. And so 
as they're waiting at the door, we know that two things would have to happen. The, the great falling away from the church, the apostasy, and the, the removal of the restraining spirit. We know those things have to happen. And there are certain things that have to happen in, in Israel and, and, and the world. But as those things happen, are we finding ourselves delivered to a concept of peace that we haven't had before? That we're ready. We're, 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 as the Bible says in James, that we're no longer wanton. It's like David said in Psalm 23, I shall not be in want. What does that mean to shall not be in want? It means that you've got everything you need. You have a contentment that comes from the Lord. You have a, an understanding of his provision for your life. You're no longer trying to fight battles by yourself, but instead going to the Lord and meeting them together with him. And I, I don't know about you, but I would much rather show up with the Holy Spirit, show up with the sovereign God of the universe for a battle than, than show up by myself. It transforms everything. It, it changes everything I do. And that's that's what I want to pray for. Is that this word begins to give us a lack of wantonness, a contentment, a peace, an understanding that, that he's going to provide every single thing we need when we need it. And sometimes just right when, when we're absolutely in the midst of, for, or of a foray, that suddenly we will get, be given the gift that we needed because it, re, it was required to us to be in the instance before we received the wisdom or the, the weaponry or the understanding or the deliverance. And so remaining close to Christ is the objective. Remaining attuned to the Holy Spirit is the objective. Remaining attached to God's plan for the universe is the objective. Because my consistent connection to him, my perpetual connection through prayer, my constant prayer is always going to mean that I am, I am fully prepared for any instance that comes my way. I'm no longer wanting. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He's going to bring me exactly where and when and what I need to face any situation in the world because it's for his outcome. I'm, I'm his ambassador. I'm his tool. I'm his doulos. I'm his slave, you know, voluntary slave to the master of righteousness. I want to be where and when he needs me with whatever he needs me to have in order to, to complete the task before me. And so my, my objective is to stay as close to him as, as I can. And I do that through prayer, through reading his word, you know, through, through staying in, in perhaps through singing at the top of my lungs, his worship. Precious Lord, we come before you today just eager to get into your word, Lord, thankful to be brothers and sisters that are connected and unified by your glory, Lord, that we are attached to you. And being attached to you, we we surpass the the, the temporality of this universe. We, we have become eternal. We're reaching into the heavenlies, Lord. And so being eternal, we, we need to learn those, those tools of eternal life. Let, let your word begin to transform us, Lord, to change us into those eternal beings that, that the rest in this world begin to see a peace in us that leads them to the cross. I love you, Father. I love you, and I just, I thank you for, I thank you for kicking my butt. I thank you for, for holding my hand. I thank you for lifting me up. I thank you for for reproving me. I thank you for changing me. I thank you for transforming me. I thank you for, for pointing out and convicting me of those things that still need to be changed. 
that I might surrender those parts of my life, that I might give way to your master craftsmanship, that I might delete myself any obstacles that I'm placing on the road to my transformation. I love you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the word. May it wash over us. May it cleanse us. May it prepare us. May it um, it give us that that contentment that we're no longer wanting. That we know we're when it's right, when it's time, when it's perfect, we're going to receive exactly what you need us to receive to do the work that you have before us. And give us an understanding of the, the Christ, crucible, Lord, the Christus, the, the, um, the potter's wheel, and the pain that comes with that, the, the pain of transformation, the pain of pregnancy, the, the pain of, of having dross removed, having poisons removed. It's a necessary function, and I thank you for it, Lord. We love you and we praise you and we we ask all these prayers and we lay before you all of our burdens and all of our cares and take back that wonderful peace that surpasses all worldly understanding as we focus upon you, Lord, and let you worry about the enemy. Moses said, the Lord is a man of war. He fights for us. He understood. I thank you, Lord, for fighting every battle for me. That I may go about my business of trying to love up on saints and love up and upon the lost. Fully protected by your armor. I love you and I praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. What a good day. What a wonderful day. Hosea chapter 8. Set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and has trespassed against my law. That's the Lord speaking to us, the church. It'll send an eagle against us because we have transgressed his law. We have transgressed the covenant. We have trespassed. Israel shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. Israel has cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. We have cast off our relationship with the Lord. We have given up the shield of our faithfulness in pursuit of worldly things. And because we gave up that good thing, the enemy is pursuing us. That's what happens. It's the fateful act of God upon a, a nation that's going to be transformed. Is that, look, I will use every tool that I've created. Uh, and the enemy being a tool, I will use the enemy against you to chastise you, to transform you, to bring you back to me. Because that's what you're there for. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not, of their silver and their gold. Have they made them idols that they may be cut off? Look at our representatives, folks. They won't do the right thing because they're so worried about getting those millions and millions of dollars of graft or, or donations to, to their further desire to remain in power the next election cycle. They have sold themselves to the idols of silver and gold. They no longer pursue representation of a holy and righteous people for a holy and righteous God. Thy calf, O Samaria, hath cast thee off. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it be ere they attain to innocency. We pursued our own lusts, folks. We're looking for our fulfillment 
here in the world by whatever cow we're ch chasing, whatever golden calf we're chasing, we're looking for fulfillment in this plane. And we've already established that we are eternal beings now, having accepted grace. We need to look forward to eternity, not to the temporality of this world. For from Israel was, was it also the workmen made it. Therefore, it is not God, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken into pieces. He's going to break up your idols, folks. He's going to destroy your worldly passions. He's going to destroy those those objectives that you're that you're seeking in the world that supplant him. He 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 it will be first in your life. You accepted the grace, right? <laughs> you know, you made the commitment. You said he's first. You said he's sovereign. You said he's the Lord of Lords, right? Now comes the difficult part, living that. For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stalk, the bud shall yield no meal. If so be it yield, the stranger shall swallow it up. He says these, these idols, these pursuits, this, these treasures of this world, they're not going to give you any good thing. They're not going to even give you any grain. And any grain that, that, that comes up out of your pursuits of it is going to be swallowed up by your enemies, by strangers. Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. You're not special when you fall into that pursuit of idols and the Lord smashes your idols, suddenly you're right in the midst of Gentiles and there's nothing special about you because it was God that was special about you. Were they all gone up to Assyria, a wild ass alone by himself, Ephraim hath hired lovers. They departed and they went to Assyria. They went to the brutality of the world. The Syrians are the worst of the worst. You know, they, they prided themselves on crushing all of their enemies' heads, their whole entire family. They, you know, they would put your heads on poles. They were that group that, that would leave nothing alive when they left. Very rarely did they take slaves. Yea, though they have hired among the nations, now will I gather them, and they shall sorrow a little for the burden of the king of princes. There you go. <laughs> they shall sorrow for the burden of the king of princes. Who's the king of princes? Because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin, Altars shall be unto him to sin. Look, you pursue sin. I'll let you build your altars, but that's all you'll get. I've written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. He didn't want my law. He didn't want the reflection of your sin that you need a savior. Because it's a reminder that you're, you're a worldly being untransformed, lacking no power, lacking no authority, lacking no e eternal life, or adoption in the kingdom of the Most High. They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of men's offerings and eat it, but the Lord accepteth them not. Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins. They shall return to Egypt. Folks, the Lord has always known the wicked. And he's going to separate them into the world. Return them to Egypt. Egypt always represents the world. For Israel hath forgotten his maker and built the temples. And Judah has multiplied fenced cities. But I will send a fire upon his cities and it shall devour the palaces thereof. We've become worldly. We've de determined we're going to take care of our own future, our own will. And because, because of that, 
There's no connection to the Lord's desire for our life. There's no unwanted behavior. We crave. We continue to crave. We want more and more and more. Bigger and prouder. With more gold. Rejoice not, O Israel, for joy as other people. For thou hast gone a-whoring from thy Lord. Thou hast loved a reward upon every corn floor. The Lord looks at when we venture away from the Lord looks at us as adulterers. That's right. He's the bridegroom of the bride. When we venture away from him, the lack of innocency, we are being adulterous. And we will find it. We'll find our reward on every corn floor. Doesn't that sound repulsive? It turns something precious into something to base. The floor and the wine press shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. We're supposed to be made anew. We're the new wineskins into which a new life is poured. Born again to everlasting. But the new wine shall not touch us because we're pursuing the worldly. They shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. There you go. The wicked in the world. You shall return to Assyria or to Egypt. You'll go back into the worldly. They shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord, neither shall they be pleasing unto him. Their sacrifices shall be unto them as the bread of mourners. All the uh, that eat thereof shall be polluted. For their, their bread for their soul shall not come into the house of the Lord. Let's for a moment ask a blessing for the nation of Israel. Think about it, folks. Jesus said that their temple would be torn down. There would be no rock left upon another. And guess what? In 70 AD, that happened. Ever since 70 AD, think on it now. We're, you know, we're almost 2,000 years where they have not been able to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. And they, they believed the sacrifice is the only way to atone for their sins. So for 2,000 years, the Jews have not been able to get rid of their sin and yet they pursue it in the world and their, they, their sacrifices in the world are not going to give them what they're looking for because they're eating the bread of the world they're mourners for lo they are gone because of the destruction Egypt shall gather them up Memphis shall bury them the pleasant places where their silver nettles shall possess them thorns shall be in their tabernacles. They've lost the blessings of God. They've taken on the blessings of the world. The days of visitation are come. The days of recompense are come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is mad. For the multitude of thy iniquity and the great hatred, the watchman of Ephraim was with my God, but the prophet is a snare of a fowler in all his ways, and hatred in the house of his God. They never like prophets. They don't like prophets because prophets talk, speak against wickedness. They want, they want seers. They want oracles who tell of wondrous things coming and, you know, new ventures. They don't, they don't want prophets because prophets warn. They have deeply corrupted themselves in the days of of Gibeah, therefore he will remember their iniquity, he will visit their sins. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first stripe in the fig tree at her time, but they went to bow pure and separated themselves into that shame, and their abominations were according as they loved. They loved the world, they loved their lust, they loved their sins, they loved the gold and the silver of their idols. Over and over again, they repeated this process. 
when when given unto their own thinking, they turn to the golden calf every single time. Over and over and over again. And yet God's devotion to them, his hesed to them, means that he made a covenant with them. Why do you think he didn't, didn't let Abraham make the covenant? You're not going to make the covenant. I'll make the covenant. Because then it will be achieved. If you make it, you'll break it. I'm making the covenant with Israel. So the, this covenant with Israel, the covenants that he's made have been based upon his righteousness, his devotion, his promise. Folks, don't, don't ever count against God because God is going to fulfill his promises. Ephraim, as I saw, Tyrus is planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer and give them, O Lord, what wilt thou give? Give them a miscarrying, a womb, and dry breast. It's always the children that suffer the innocency. The, the, this, this, these awful metal gods require our youth. They require our unborn. And what are we doing? In this nation, we're sacrificing them to the to the Bal, Bal Peor, to, to Moloch, to, to the same horrible worldly gold and silver calves that the Jews did. All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more, all their princes and revolters. He's going to drive out the wicked from his house, folks. If you're a wicked man and you're in the church, guess what? You're not going to be in the church. He knows who the wicked are. You know, I got I got people out here pronouncing themselves, you know, the church hunters, and who who want to pass judgment upon the body. Look, that's not our right. There's one righteous judge. There's one bridegroom. There's one that paid the price for all of our sin and and holds the keys to sin and death. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that has the right of judgment and shared his glory in only one place. And that's with the body that we might be unified. Our job is not to ridicule the church. Our job is not to change the church. Our job is not to go forth and proclaim that the church is, is functionally illiterate or that it's been, it's, it's been infiltrated. Because guess what? The Bible already does that. Read the book of Jude. You want to do the right thing to the church? Read the book of Jude to the church. Read the read second and third revelation to the church. That's Jesus Christ's words to them. He loves them. He's in charge of them. He, he, he knows the body, and, and he's never going to allow the wicked to remain in the righteous. He won't. It says it right here again. All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. He knows who they are. He knows every art. He knows every single person that, that says they're saved and isn't saved. He knows. He knows. Don't don't take upon, upon your own shoulders the, the capacities, the, the job of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to judge the world. Our job is to love them. Our job is, to, is to, to, to tell them the gospel. The gospel is perfect, you know, for rebuke, for, for proof, for, for changing hearts. This is perfect. Read the gospel to them. Don't give them your worldly opinion. Don't get involved in, in argument. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Become something eternal. Say, look. The Lord's got this. He knows every single one of these people that, that is not saved and, and, and is trying to portray themselves as a Christian. He knows. He knows. It's not my job to, to, to sort them out. I mean, we've always asked that. Lord, you know, can you sort out the wicked from the church? And he goes, what do you tell the angels? He said, no, I don't want you to do that. 
because if you grab a handful of them, you might pull up somebody that's saved when you yank those weeds out. So don't do that. I'll do that at the time of the of throwing throwing them into the fire. He knows. Folks, we need to know who we are and who he is. Not in our own worldly functions to he, he told me to work out my work out my salvation with fear and trembling. Fearing him. Does that mean I'm supposed to go and pronounce judgment upon the next guy in, in his walk with God? No, my job is to love. And and if the worldly are in here in our church, my job is to love them too. Now, God didn't share his glory with, with them, you know, to be a unified body and unless they join the body. But if they're here, I'm going to love them. I'm going to love them. My job is to, to, to functionally allow the Lord to step in and use his tools through my life rather than using the tools that I've learned, the tools of manipulation, of calculated argument, mentalism, you know, brutality or overwhelming somebody with, you know, with, with a certain amount of wisdom or a certain amount of eloquence. You know, that's, that's all worldly stuff. My job is to love them. Doesn't that make it easy? Doesn't that deliver us to that unwanted position that we were seeking? Ephraim is smitten, their root is dried up, they shall bear no fruit, yea, though they bring forth, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. Ouch. Ouch. They, they can't bear the fruit. They don't have the Holy Spirit. And even if they bear any fruit, I will kill it. Wow. Lord, I think he's getting a little angry, Lord, don't you think? My God will cast them away because they did not hearken unto him, and they shall be wanderers among the nations. Chapter 10. Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. They made all this stuff for themselves. Not, for, not to exalt the Lord's name. Their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. He shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. God's going to separate the wicked from the good. We don't do that. He does that. And we see it happening right before us. And I, no offense to the world, but I see the countdown. I see the powers and principalities standing at, at the edge of the stage waiting for for themselves to take the stage for their denouement. It doesn't mean that my job is to separate the church, say, no, you're good, you're good, you're good. No, ah, that's his job. He'll do that. He says it right here. I'll destroy their, their altars. I'll destroy them. I'll, I'll filter them out. Their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. He shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. For now they shall say, we have no king because we feared not the Lord. What then should a king do to us? Now they're not even going to fear men because they say, you know, we didn't fear the Lord. Why, why should we fear a king? Ouch. <laughs> In trouble there, huh? They have spoken words, smearing falsely and making a covenant, thus judging springing, springeth up as hemlock in the furrows of the field. Poison springs up among the, the good crops, right? Poison. Hemlock. The inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the calves of Beth Avon, for the people thereof shall mourn over it, and the, the priests thereof that rejoiced on it for the glory thereof because it is departed from it. He goes, I'm going to smash those altars. And you're going to mourn over them. It shall be also carried into Assyria for a present to the king Jareb. Ephraim shall receive same and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. You fed, you went and, and gave altars, gave gold, paid homage, paid homage to ruthless kings. Not to the Lord. As for Samaria, her king is cut off. 
as the foam upon the water, the high places also of Aven, the sin of Israel shall be destroyed, the thorn and the thistle shall come up on their altars, and they shall say to the fountain, uh, mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. Isn't that, we, we remember a similar text there where people are running for the from the wrath of the Lamb and asking the mountains to fall upon them. O Israel, thou hast sinned from the days of Gibeah. There they stood, the battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. It is my desire that I should chastise them, and the people shall be gathered against them when they shall bind themselves into their two furrows. And Ephraim is as an heifer that is taught and love, love it to tread out the corn, but I passed over upon her fair neck. I will make Ephraim to ride. Judah shall plow, and Jacob shall break up his cloths. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. There it is, folks. It's time to seek the Lord that he might rain righteousness back upon us. It's time to put us put aside our worldly pursuits. It, it, the countdown is well into it, its last stages. We see the enemy at the gates. We know what's coming. We see the one world government standing up. That happened fast, didn't it? That's what the Bible says. We'll go. Ye have plowed wickedness. Ye have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst trust in thy way and the multitude of thy mighty men. You trusted in yourselves, and what'd you get? You got fed lies and feces. That's what you got fed. Therefore shall a tumult Arise among thy people, and all thy fortresses shall be spoiled as Shalman spoiled Beth Arbel in the day of battle. Her mother was dashed in pieces upon her children, so shall Bethel do unto you because of your great wickedness. In the morning shall the king of Israel utterly be cut off. Whew, that is tough, folks. That's a tough word. That's that's the Lord telling us, look, look I, I've got some plans for you, and I'm going to shape you, and I'm going to I'm going to break your altars. I'm going to I'm going to change you from your your wickedness. I'm going to bring you back from your own pursuits. I'm going to do it. The Lord's going to do it, not not the people. It's His promise He made to them to 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 have a remnant, not theirs. They didn't promise to come back to Him. It's His prophecy that He says, "Look, I will turn my face back to Israel, and they will be saved." That's his prophecy, not theirs. This is his plan in which the enemy participates because the enemy knows what's coming. And the one win the enemy can get, the Lord rebuke him if he so chooses, is watching us lose along with him. When we could have chosen grace, when we could have walked in the, the transformation of, of rebirth, It's a blessing to be reborn in, in God's hands. I'm not going to say it doesn't come with a, a certain amount of requisite pain. You know, uh, he's giving me a lesson right now. I've, I've had a tooth that's been loose for about a year now. And I've, I've been trying to pull it for the last 10 days. And if, if I pull it the way it needs to be pulled, it's going to break some other teeth. Because it's entrenched. And so the pain has been just wonderful. <laughs> it really is. You know, it's that wonderful pain that, you know, you go, wow, I, um, you know, what is my pain tolerance? What is, what is, what is my tolerance of pain with regard to the Lord? What, what can I do without him? I can't do anything without him. I'm basically functionally illiterate as it is. And so, you know, I have to empty myself of myself and say, Lord, fill me with you. Fill me with your good plans. Fill me with your intentions. 
you know, take from me whatever this, whatever needs to be ta taken from me. You know, heat me up to 1500 or 2000 degrees so that you can remove the dross and, and make me into purified gold or silver for your good purposes. And believe me, folks, that the, the trials and the testimonies that you're going to go through in this world, the things that it required to have your own idols shattered in front of you, your, your own adultery to him shattered in front of you is painful. It's painful to realize that you've put other things in your life first when God should be taking that position. But that's between you and him. You know, I just call you to that place where we begin to respect his law, where we, we, we take a, 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 a sane look upon our own salvation and we go, look, I, I'm not where he needs me to be. You know, I've got this, 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 and this, and probably 12 other things that, that really need to be transformed. That's the basis of this world. That is what, what we just read about, is that the nation of Israel refused to do that. They refused to look upon them, their own behaviors. They went full on worldly and said, look, we're, we're going to, you know, we, don't, we weren't afraid of God. We're just going to go and we're going to serve these kings, these foreign kings, and we'll lay, lay our gold before them. And what did the Lord say? Look, I'll smash those altars. I'll smash all that stuff. And I will bring you back to me because that's his promise. I don't want to, folks, I, I know for a fact that I'm not going to leave this world without fulfilling what he planned for me. I know that because that's the promise I've asked of him. But I don't want to be an obstacle to achievement of that goal. I don't want to be resisting God by, by rowing the boat the opposite direction, you know, or, or, or saying, look over there, you know, oh, woe is me. Look at the despairing world. Look at the, the enemy who's more powerful than me. I could care less about the enemy. May the Lord rebuke him if he so chooses. That's, look, he, he's fighting God, not me. He's, he wants to consume our lives. But guess what? We've been saved. You know, it's them that I'm worried about. Those that are out there that have no protection and there's a grand deception about to be perpetrated over the world, whole world and the Lord's going to darken their eyes further. That's huge. I personally want what God wants for the church. That we set ourselves apart, holy and righteous, as a bride preparing herself for the bridegroom with oil in our lamp, knowing that he might come like a thief in the night, which is the Jewish tradition when 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 a Jewish you know man asked a woman to marry him, he he left her at his parents and he went away to build a house for her. And then he showed up like a thief in the night, sometime down the road when he has finished the house, to grab her from her family and and bring her to her new home. That's the picture that Jesus Christ has painted us, that he is our betrothed. We are to be wed to him. And how many of us who, who are getting about to get married as men or women set ourselves apart in innocence? In innocence? For that, before that wedding. That's what God wants. You know, we're being prepared to be a, a wife, a dutiful wife, an unadulterous wife, fully committed to to the bridegroom. Now that may see strange, seem strange to, you know, for a man to focus upon that, but conceptually, it's just like the parables. It's not hard to grasp. He wants to be holy and righteous and pure, just as any man would, would want to, his fiancée to be. 
that's what we want. We want innocence. We we want to know that we're you know we're the the only love, the first love. I love you, folks. It's such a grand pleasure to be with you. And you know this this old world's winding down. Don't fear it. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling with the Lord, and know that everything here He's got. Stick close to him. Keep your eyes on him. Don't worry about this world. Look at the good things in this world. Look at the, the good things that he's left for us. You know, the kids smiling, the old folks telling us wisdom, the, you know, a, a wonderful song or hymn, a brother that just loves his wife and dotes on her and a good father and a good mother and people doing right in their communities. I mean, those are the things we want to focus on. Because those are the things that are eternal. They won't be wiped out. Wickedness is going to be removed. And I'm sorry for the lost. I really am. Because I, I, I'm, I want to tell them. This is a free will choice you can make yourself. You're, the Lord did not develop hell for, for, for man. Man chooses to go there. Hell was developed for a, a lead you know, a third of the angels and their, their ruler that, that fell from heaven. That's what the lake of fire has been developed for. We, we decide to go ourselves because we're unwilling to accept the gift of grace. Unwilling to, to declare the Lord is sovereign. Yeah, I've been, I'll tell you, I'd, I've been using this Ambisol lately, but I can't get this tooth out, man. It's, you know, I think that's been part of the thing is that, you know, it's so loose, but it's still attached to the other teeth, the root. And I don't want to pull out a bunch of teeth by yanking it really hard, you know. So um, it's been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the pain level I've been I've been going oh you know I, bet, I might as well I got two choices I can either hate it or I can you know investigate it sit in it sit in the fire for a while I love you folks I I, I pray for you a wonderful day and um Look, don't get don't get so worried about the world and, and don't let the world sing the song, the siren song that drags you into your worldly behaviors and in how you treat them. You're born again of, of, of new fruits, new wine. You can use tools that, that they don't have. And so in my own instance, I speak to myself, I I can be gentle where I used to, you know, win arguments through forcefulness. I can be patient. Where I used to speak all the words instead of listening. I love you folks. I'm going to leave it here and just pray for you a wonderful day. And remember, when you go into the throne room, when you go into the throne room, don't carry a pack back out of there. Leave your burdens at the cross. Leave your burdens at the at the foot of the throne. Take back peace. You aren't merit meant to carry those burdens. The Lord can take it. If you're carrying them around, you're doing it by choice. And that's not what the Lord, he said, bring me those who are weary and heavy laden. You know, those people that have a heavy backpack and I will give them rest. Take back his rest. I love you folks. There's so many here that, that need help and and love. You know, Russ and, and Sherry, thank you so much for, for your kindness. Um, Melinda, she just needs love. Folks, she's going through a tough time and uh, you know, with cancer and gonna have to go through surgery, and that's coming up, so pray for her. And AV, I haven't seen her in a while. I, I have to 
maybe call her. And Bev, you know, people got family members who are sick and cancers and heart heart ailments and kidney ailments. This is the time when the enemy is truly testing the sons and daughters of God because he's hoping to paralyze us. May the Lord rebuke him. You know, that brings me joy because it means that we're, we're at the doorway. We're at the, we're at the precipice. We're at that, that point where we know that the enemy is waiting at the, at the edge of the stage and doesn't want us to, to represent, doesn't want us to go out and heal people, doesn't want us to, to set them free from their captivity to, to spirits of the fallen. Doesn't want us to plant seeds for the greatest harvest in, in the history of mankind. Because that's where we are. That's where we're residing, is in the greatest harvest in the history of mankind coming up. Rejoice, folks. Rejoice. I love you. If anybody needs anything, please let me know. And uh, just, if you can, for a moment, remember how much God adores you. And just for a moment. You now I get this picture of my oldest brother old, holding his first son. And looking down on him. And when I saw that, I, I knew how the Lord looked at me. You know? There are good things here. There are things that will outlast the temporariness of this world. Focus on those things. Thank you for coming. I, I greatly appreciate the time. The greatest gift I, I've been given but grace. Thank you so much.